So welcome to CSC 239, Scientific Computing Applications. We are focusing today on content for our first module and for our first solution. And uh, essentially what we wanted to do was to start with this idea. If you completed 1.1 assignment and obtained a legitimate copy of the textbook and started the reading that was assigned here in our module specifics, right? So as you look in Blackboard at the module and you take a look at the topics that will engage in module one and the learning outcomes, we ask you to start reading chapter one, sections 2.1 through 2.3 in chapter two and section 3.1 of chapter three. So those are very specific sections. We don't want you to get the rest of the way into chapter two. Uh, we don't wanna traumatize you too early. <laughs> and uh, we don't want you to go any further in chapter three, but, but we're going to be covering some related concepts in our student learning objectives for the module, right? Uh, that relate to what we have here. So. Uh, we want to understand from the very beginning, what are the core computing competencies expected of STEM professionals, right? So STEM professionals are science, technology, engineering, and math professionals. And this quote right from the textbook in section 1.3 is probably the best way to explain it. A research assistant must know how to organize and to analyze data, as well as how to perform basic calculations, and then to present the findings derived from this research in a clear, crisp way. That's probably the very best explanation of our purpose for this course and for uh, the activities that we're gonna engage all throughout the semester, right? So we're going to be learning how to organize and analyze the data, then to perform basic uh, data processing, right? Data analysis and processing. And then we're going to take the results or outcomes from the calculations and algorithms and, and uh, crunching, number crunching, uh, data queries and so on. And we're going to present those findings in, in a concise and clear and clean way. To that end, some writing skills are really important to review. And I, I wanted to take a minute to talk to you about the 1.3 assignment, the article review. And did we or did we not cover this yet in class? Does anyone remember covering the article summary in class? Uh, no, we did not do that. No. OK. so. Uh, I'm not a fan of uh, English composition. Uh, when I was an undergrad, it was one of my most feared courses. Uh, I didn't do too well with writing assignments, right? Now, over time, I learned some very important things about writing and how to keep it simple and sane. And I agreed to teach to do something called writing across the curriculum, where we do a little bit of writing in the context of our subject matter, right? And so that's what is motivated behind the 1.3 assignment, right? So what I've done is, is uh, given you, what, what the article summary is about is your opportunity to identify an article that has to do with scientific computing, okay? And one of your personal interests. The key to making this a quick and easy assignment is to think about scientific computing, right? Anything that has to do with laboratory or science or experimental computing, right? And if there's something that is most interesting to you, could be, um, computing challenges for uh, turtle studies, if you're a biology major, or it could be um, 
uh, molecule structure simulations in biochemistry, right? It could be could be any aspect of scientific computing. It could be something that, that has to do with gene uh, gene research and DNA. Um, in any case, what I want you to do is I want you to think for a minute about your own interests and then about computing in general, right? And, and what that means. And as a guide, when we're talking about scientific computing, we're talking about organizing and analyzing data, basic processing and analysis, right? And then presenting those, those details in, in a, an inappropriate manner, right? So when we talk about scientific computing applications, that's it in a nutshell right here. And then think about your own personal interests. Then I want you to go hunting online for an article. Now the article cannot be a blog. It cannot be an opinion in a chat or a threaded uh, forum. It cannot be something out on social media in Facebook or on uh, Instagram or something like that. It, it cannot be a product review. Okay. Oh, the latest uh, 3D printers. Wow. Well, let's let's review about uh, 3D printing. Although there's an awful lot of really cool stuff that has to do with 3D printing and being able to create things with 3D printing. And as long as you're not reviewing 3D printers because you're doing a product review, that would be fine. If you're stuck, I would take this assignment and go to the I, I would go to the UVI library. I would show them this assignment and then I would give them some topics that you're interested in. Oh, I'm interested in working in this particular discipline when I get my degree finished or, and then, and then let them help you identify a peer reviewed journal or it can be an online magazine article. And to guide you in this assignment, Right. This is the only writing assignment. This is the only written assignment for the for the whole course. Right. It's a two paragraph writing assignment. Basically, uh, I give you my own example. So I have a sample article called "The End of Code," and then I have my own article summary, which I created based on the requirements of the writing assignment. Right. So you're going to find an article or a, uh, an online magazine. Um, and I'm going to click on this just so you can see what it's about. Right. So this is called The End of Code. And it's in Wired Magazine, which is, you know, a credible technology uh, magazine. And they carry this online as well as in hard copy print. And they happen to do some very decent research about their topics. And, and so it, in, in 2016, I found this article that said, soon we won't program computers. We'll just train them like dogs because see, they're gonna do machine learning and artificially, they're gonna be artificially intelligent. So we don't have to learn how to code. We won't be coding. All we're going to do is, is uh, train them like dogs. And then it talks about all of the different uh, aspects of how this is going to be a challenge, right? So what does it mean, the end of code? If we're not gonna be writing code, what does that mean for us? Are computer programmers gonna be out of a job if computers are learning their own thing, right? So I read about this article and then based on the assignment and, and actually, Let's go back to the assignment. I wanna talk about what is the assignment, right? What is the assignment? Here are the essentials. You're going to create a summary of that article and you're gonna do it by, by writing two paragraphs, okay? So, so the main idea here is you find a decent article you're interested in, you read it. And then in the first paragraph, you just give me a summary of the article in your own words. I don't want you to paraphrase or copy and paste and then start using a thesaurus. Don't do that. Don't do it. Just don't. Because I run that through SafeAssign. And if you take some key 
summary sentences and then just change up some of the words, you won't pass the score for the safe assign. And that'll be a problem. Okay. But what I want you to do is I want you to read the article, jot down some basic ideas and concepts, and then connect them, right? And then start working with them. Uh, give me a summary of the article in your own words. Now, a paragraph, a proper paragraph is at least five sentences. I say six to eight sentences, but you can get away with five sentences. Uh, in terms of proper English composition, a paragraph has a topic sentence, three or four supporting sentences, and then a closing or concluding sentence, right? Any questions on what a paragraph is? What we do for the first half, right? Second half. The second half of your article summary is going to be a second paragraph where you explain to the person who is reading your own article summary, okay, why was this article important to you? Why was it interesting to you? Or why should it be interested? How is it, it may be interesting to other people, right? Why is this topic so relevant? What's the catch? Okay. You picked an article on the challenges of data analysis for turtle studies. Why should, why is that a big deal? Because if you can't find out why turtles are going extinct, we're going to have a world, world without turtles, right? And, and that means that there are all sorts of other problems that spin off and you explain what that is, right? And so you, you say we need better tools to study turtles and we need that means we need more effective ways to analyze the data or more importantly, to collect the data because when they're in the water, we can't get the data out of the sensors that we put on them and that's a problem, right? I'm just using one example here, but the point is, is you have a first paragraph that tells me what is your article about? And the second paragraph is, why should I care? Why should others care? Why is it important, right? Two paragraphs. Now, there's a couple of other things that you have to do. You have to use proper spelling and grammar, right? And there's a certain format you should use. So I give you an example to go by. I don't want to leave anything to chance. I'm going to give you an example to go by, right? So I'm basically going to, let me show you my example. So I, I showed you my article my sample article, and now here's my sample summary, okay? Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. I took the main ideas of the article on the end of code, and then I wrote this paragraph. Here's what my article is about, okay? I chose to give my summary a different title than the title of the article I reviewed. But you don't have to do that. You can use the same, I could have said the end of code, right? Could have used the same title as the article at the top of the page. And then here's my second paragraph. Here's why it matters. We may be in for serious trouble. Machine learning is generated by very large, extremely complex data sets and formula formulas, practical debugging and reverse engineering will not work. This means that when something goes wrong, the system is a black box that defies investigation or analysis. A few months ago, a wealthy young professional was killed when his self-driving Tesla failed to account for an 18-wheel truck. It interpreted the 18-wheel truck, the colors on the trailer, it thought oh, this is just another road sign. And it drove under the 18-wheel truck, decapitating its occupant, okay? Now that's just one example of a problem. When they tried to figure out what was going on with it, they couldn't figure out what was going on with it. it the person said, well, you know, it's kind of like pulling off the, the top of your skull and looking down at the gray matter in your brain to try to figure out what a, what a person is thinking. Can you determine what a person is thinking by peeling back their skull and looking at their gray matter? No, no. And that's the problem with machine learning and AI. It's kind of a black box, right? And what does that mean? It means that if something goes wonkers, 
we don't have a way of figuring out what happened to it because we didn't set it up. We didn't create it. We didn't design it. We didn't specify the criteria. This was a machine doing its own thing, right? So I tried to make it relevant by saying, look, hey, this could be a big deal, and this is why. And that was my second paragraph. I want you to do the same for your article. I want you to find something you are personally interested in. This is going to be a lot easier if you find something you enjoy writing about. And then tell me what the article is about in the first paragraph. And then tell me, why should I give a darn? Why does it matter? Now, other than having a title at the top, at the bottom, you're going to include a proper APA style reference. And this is framed like, like a proper APA style reference. You will note that the title of the article is not completely consistent with APA style criteria. Typically, when you're citing a magazine article, it's just the first word that's capitalized, and then all the rest of them are not, um, the first letter is not capitalized. It's books that are written like this uh, with, with uh, the title of the book being, the first letter being capitalized. But I didn't want to split hairs as long as it's close to an APA style reference as long as it's like an APA style reference for your article, I wanna be able to click on this. Now, if I can't click on it, if I can't go to the web and look at that article, that's a non-starter. Do not submit an article summary for something that I can't click on the link and go there, okay? And how do you create the link? Well, that, that's pretty easy actually. Um, Let's see, when you, when you click on your article, where, where, did, it, where did it go? Uh, nope. Article summary. All you have to do is paste in the URL and then in Word, there's an option in Microsoft Word you highlight that stuff and then you right click it with your right mouse button and go to link. And then you paste the link in right here. And that's, that's how that link uh, is created. That's how I create links for my, um, my study guides, right? Now, let's say you don't wanna create the link. I'm gonna copy this and paste it into a I'm gonna copy and paste it into a browser and you know it's not good if I can't get there. Another thing I don't want you to do is I don't want you to get the help of the library and, and uh, what they do is they, they give, you go, to, you go to the library online, you search in their databases and you find an abstract. And so you give me a summary of the abstract. Well, an article abstract, if I can't read the whole article, that's, that's, that's no good. Because if, if I click on that link and all it gives me is an abstract of something I have to pay to read, it's called a paywall. If, if you get the library staff to help you and they, they, they get you an interesting article, but all you can do to access it is, is to read the abstract. The abstract is a summary. It is an article review. It is an article summary. So the one you know, aside from being no blogs, no Facebook, that kind of thing, uh, you, you can't you can't give me an article review of what is basically another article review. Are there any questions about this assignment? Yes, I have one question. Mm -hmm. Are we limited to the library's database or? Oh no. No, you're not. Okay. That's, a, that's a great question. You're not limited to the library database. You can, in fact, one of the best ways to find something really cool is to go to scholars.google.com. Uh, or is it scholar? There we go. 
So did you know that if you go to scholar.google.com, instead of just getting a regular Google search, like if I do a regular Google search of endangered penguins, it's going to give me all manner of stuff that it knows I'm interested in, my personal preferences and so on. And, and it's, going to, it's going to give me a flavor about endangered penguins and how to get involved and save them and join Greenpeace and all that other crap. But if I go to scholar.google.org and I go to endangered penguins, it, it's going to give me details uh, that has to do with uh, peer reviewed research, uh, periodicals, uh, journals, all that kind of stuff, right? And here's a peer reviewed. The African Journal of Marine Science, 2012. So when I click into this, if I can get the entire article, that's good. If the only thing I can get is the abstract, that's, you can't, you're not allowed to give me a summary of a summary, okay? But, but I'm glad you asked the question. A lot of times when you hit these, uh, articles, there's another link on here about full, see the full article. A lot of times they're open source. So another uh, one, one thing that's very helpful from Google Scholar, if you go back there with the initial search, they show you whether there's a PDF available. They show you what now? They show you whether there's a free PDF available for the entire article. Interesting. So, so yeah, type in penguins in and and you will see it. All right, see uh, the column on the right hand side where it says PDF, that, that first article up on the right hand side. Now don't open it. Don't open it. Move to the right. Move your cursor to the right. Open that. Oh, all the way to the right. Open that, and that's uh -huh. the PDF. And then oh. they, have the full, they have the full article right there. Bill, I never knew that. Thank I you. didn't either until I found out about all those paywalls. <laughs> and then somebody helped me out with that one. So that was a, that's so amazing. When, I'm, when I am looking at that, I normally just look at the articles that have a PDF. Right. And, so. Right. So here's a... Uh, University of, where is this? UMSL.edu, wherever that is. It could be University of Missouri, St. Louis, I'm guessing. Yeah, they have the full, the full article. Outstanding. And another hint is if you go back, go back from there. Um, in that same paragraph where it describes the article, yeah. you see um, in the bottom line of that is a quote. But there's, yes. there's a star in the quote. If you click on that, um, that, that will give you the citation in the different formats. Right. So go to the APA and click on that, and they'll copy it and paste it from there. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. That's, uh, that's very, very helpful. Um, yeah, I, I knew that scholar.google.com, I, I didn't know that they added this where it populates the full PDF over on the side. That's that's a bonus. So yeah, it's a good day. We're all learning something. All right, so the main thing is not to get intimidated or make this too complicated. Find something that you find interesting, read it, Tell me about it in a paragraph in your own words. Then do some quick spell checking and grammar checking, right? Everybody has access to Word. If you, if you want, you can log in to Word online using your Office 365 login in the My Campus portal. You don't even have to install Word on your, on your device or your laptop. It'll, it'll work a grammar and spelling check for you. Uh, and away you go. So um, are there any questions about our assignment?
1.3. Not at the moment. This is worth mention here. So your first solution is not worth typically what most solutions, uh, most solutions are worth five points. Um, you're doing additional assignments in the first module, okay, for, for additional credit. Um, and all we want you to do is to set up the virtual machine. So you're not really using it yet. So it's a two point solution. But what's important to understand is this piece right here. Does everybody see this right here? Yeah. What does that stand yes. for? Yes. No? Yes. yes, gigabytes. This virtual machine uh, sets itself up. It's an OVA file, but it's out on Dropbox. And uh, essentially, it's provided by the author. So if you look at the MIT press, and then you look at this before you rent it or buy it, there's a download the virtual machine option right here. And as you click on that, that's the same link. That is the same link as the one that's in Blackboard, right? So as you click on this link, it's going to take you to that site. Now, what's so important about this? Um, this is a nine point, it's, it's basically a 9.5 gigabyte file, not gigabits, gigabytes. And I'm sitting on a very fast internet connection now in the Carolinas, but most of us in the Virgin Islands have between five and 20 megabits download. It's gonna take a while. And, and so what I did was I changed the original deadline. I, I moved this back to 3 p.m. Tuesday of next week. And that would give you between now and Tuesday to download this and then set it up, okay? So once it's downloaded, uh, I'm gonna have a separate YouTube video on what you do to finish setting it up. But I will walk through the process uh, very quickly. Did we or did we not install VirtualBox in class? in our previous sessions? No, we didn't do that. I thought- Was that, yeah. that's what you yeah. just showed us, right? Well, I, I showed you, I, I showed you where to download the virtual machine that runs uh -huh. inside VirtualBox. But, oh. and I, I may have showed you where to get VirtualBox. So what I- I don't like, think you did. What I'd like to do now is show you where to get VirtualBox. After you finish the 1.2 assignment, your laptop or your PC is in a better place to run virtual machines. So the whole point of finishing 1.2 by today was to get it in a good place where you could do this. You're going to go to virtualbox.org. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay. And now that I think about it, I better get another screenshot because I think I think Luke, I think Luke joined us. And I don't know that I have. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but somebody else dropped off. Um, it's. Asante. No, Asante's here. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. It's not Nikel. It's not to Tommy Tommy Romano. Romano. Tom, Tommy Romano was here. Now, now he's gone. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, let me do that.
All right. Yeah, I don't. Uh, Tommy's uh, connection might have might have dropped. All right. So can everybody see we're in virtualbox.org? Can I click this? And then if I have a Windows machine, I'm going to select this one. If I have a Mac, I'm going to select this one. Does anyone run Linux? Is anyone running a Linux distribution on their laptop instead of Windows or Mac OS? So you click this if you're Windows, click this if you're Mac, it's going to give you a download that looks like uh, this. Let's find this. Oh my. It'll give you a download that looks like this, VirtualBox 6.1.26. If it's a Mac, it's going to end in a DMG instead of an EXE. And then you also download this, this piece right here. The VirtualBox extension pack allows your specific hardware on your laptop or PC to translate um, your hardware components. It's kind of like hardware drivers, uh, video card drivers, and what kind of mouse and touchpad you have so that you get better results. Uh, when you plug in a USB, you can connect the USB to your virtual machine. You're going to click, and it's it's one package that does it all. So you're just going to click on all supported platforms. And when you click on all supported platforms, it's going to, by the way, I need to stop this other download. I'm going to stop this download. Um, I've already got it downloaded. It's uh, basically uh, it takes takes a takes a good while to to download. Um, so you're going to end up with two two things: this download and that download. You're going to take the virtual box and use your right mouse button and select run as administrator. So if you take your right mouse button, a context menu will pop up. And then you select with your left mouse button, run as administrator. A little pop-up screen is going to say, are you sure you want to do this? I'm going to say yes. And it's going to want to install VirtualBox. I'll say next. I'll select, I'll just say next, 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 and accept all the defaults. At some point, it's going to squawk and say that it's going to disrupt the network connection. We may drop our Zoom session for just a moment, but in case we do, just stick around. I'll be right back. But when you do this, it's going to it's going to create a virtual network interface for your virtual machines, and and that may temporarily disrupt your internet service. So you're going to say yes, and then install, and it's going to run through this. And then as soon as it's finished installing, it should open up. Doesn't take long. I'm going to leave this checkbox loaded here. And when I say finish, it should fuss about the extension pack. Sometimes it doesn't fuss about the extension pack. So you'll have a screen that looks like this. And the 10 gigabyte, the nine and a half gigabyte file that you're downloading is going to be imported as an appliance. So you're importing an appliance when you uh, create your virtual machine. So all you have to do is import the appliance and then select your file. Now, I'm not going to do that just yet because I didn't install the extensions. When I finish, though, I should be able to see 6.1.26. So this is the screenshot that you're going to capture to submit for part of your solution. You're going to show that you set up VirtualBox. Now, one other thing I want to do while it's open, I want to double click on this. And that's going to load the extension pack. I'm going to reinstall. 
it should say install or reinstall. I'm going to slide down my license agreement and so and then say I agree. It's also a very good idea to read that sometime. Let's say OK. And away we go. Now, I should have the nine and a half gigabit uh, OVA file inside here, I think. Uh, let's see. Oh, don't tell me I didn't. Eh. I thought I had this already. Yeah, here it is. Okay. So that's going to give you the uh, PG book VM 2020.zip file. I usually like to go to my C drive and create a temp folder. And uh, inside the temp folder, I like to create a folder called VM. And, and that, that allows me to build any virtual machines on my local hard disk. VirtualBox likes to install the, set up the virtual machines inside a VirtualBox folder inside my documents. But if your laptop or your PC is rigged so that my documents populates to OneDrive in the cloud with your Office 365 edition, it's going to want to create a virtual machine that's 20 gigabytes large out on the cloud with Office 365. It's going to take forever. It's never going to finish loading. You're going to ask, what the hell is wrong? I want to cue you to this in advance. So the best thing to do is to open up your C drive and create a new folder called temp or VM. And then inside here, under the machine, well, let, let me let me open this up again. Inside here, I can go into preferences and then say the default machine folder is in the temp, I'll say other, and then I go into the C drive, right? I'm gonna pick this computer and then C drive and then temp and then virtual machine so that my default machine folder is either C VM or C temp VM. Are there any questions about specifying a dedicated folder on your hard drive for your virtual machine? Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, the other day when you and I were talking about this, you suggested I had a USB drive. Is this what you had in mind for the USB? Put that folder on the USB drive so uh, it wouldn't crash my machine? That's a great question. You can use a USB drive. No, I, I think the original intent was for you to be able to save any work that you wanted uh, off of your machine before you did the optimizing your personal technology activity. You can, you can load a virtual machine on a thumb drive if it's a USB 3.0 or higher uh, USB port and, and USB drive. And oftentimes that's not the case. Um, so that, that means that it takes a long time for the virtual machine to, to load. Um, if I haven't answered your question completely, let me know and we can cover it a little more at the end of class. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you. So after you set up the preferences here, what I wanna do is show you one other thing. When it came down from the internet, this 9.5 gigabyte, I just called it 10 for 9.53 gigabytes. I want you to notice that the size of this file on my disk is 10 comma 238605308 bytes. By the time I finish dividing by 1024 and dividing by 1024 for kilobytes and megabytes, it's uh, and then one more time for gigabytes, it's 9.53 gigabytes. But 
you can see it's over 10 gigabytes in terms of just raw bytes, right? Um, why am I showing you this number? Your file should also, the size should be 238-605-308 bytes. If it isn't, you probably didn't get a good copy of it. The other thing I'd tell you is that this is also a zip file. It's compressed. You have to open it by double clicking on it and then grabbing the OVA file, right clicking it to copy it, and then copy the file out, paste it into uh, your temp folder. That's going to take a couple of minutes, three minutes here. The uncompressed file inside the zip container is going to be uh, somewhat larger. And it's the OVA file that this is unpacking. That's what you use to import the, the appliance inside your virtual box. OK. So once again, check the size of your zip file by going to properties and then open it up by double clicking on it and copy the contents and move that into your VM directory. If you have a Mac, just uh, double click on the zip file and in a Mac, it'll open up. You can basically take that same OWA file, use command C and then put it on your desktop or, or put it in the folder that you created temp or VM folder you created on your Mac. Any I have a question. Yes. So the zip file and VM file, uh -huh. all the files that we're looking for, after downloading the, um, what's it called? The virtual box. After downloading everything, these files are going to automatically show up or these are files that we're going to have to create on our own? Uh, that's a good question. So when you download the virtual box and the extension pack, when you when you install this and then load the extension pack, you should see something in your in your start menu under Oracle or under virtual box. Oracle virtual box, and you should see Oracle virtual box. In a, in a Mac environment, it would be in your applications folder. And it's this software that allows a virtual machine or a virtual appliance to load. So when you click on the link in Blackboard to download the virtual appliance from the publisher, this is the data file that's read by and opened up by VirtualBox. So this is kind of like a very large database and this is sort of like Access or Excel, all right? So you're, you're, going to, you're going to install this software and it's this software that knows how to open up and import the appliance. I'll show you in just a second how that works as soon as the, the copy process is finished, okay? Does that help answer your question? Yeah, it does. I just wanted to know, because you did say to make a, um, a separate file, a temp, you said? Yes. That's what we're going to have to create on our own to, yes. put, to put VM in. Well, no. You, you, you may not have to. If you don't use Office 365 and, and it doesn't use your documents folder in the cloud, when, when you install Office, like if you go to the campus portal and, and then you. Yes, I know. And you go to the Office 365 on the campus portal. What will happen is, is that uh, when you install Office, it has a nasty habit of putting everything in my documents out in OneDrive in the cloud. So whenever you try to save anything, there's a documents folder out in the cloud in your OneDrive cloud disk. You have a terabyte of drive space in the cloud, one terabyte large, it's huge. But in the most, uh, in the latest version of Windows 10 and in Office 365, 
instead of this being the local drive, it puts it in the cloud. So I, I said, you gotta, you gotta create a separate directory that you wanna put your virtual machines in. It could be named temp. I, I have a temp folder for all sorts of reasons. So I could create a separate one like this, where I take my, my mouse and then I use my right mouse button and I go to new and I create a new folder and I call it VM. Okay, so you're just suggesting that we, for this, um, for the VM, for when we're using virtual box and stuff like that, you're just suggesting that we put it in a separate file away from everything else? Yes. Okay. Because later on, when you want your disk space back, all you have to do is go to that folder. And, and delete it? And just delete it. Okay, okay, I got it. And then, and then the virtual machine is gone. And, and you get all your disk space back, provided you empty your, your recycle bin, right? Okay. Yeah. And uh, one more question. So then after, then, wait, so wait, we're wait, deleting wait. this. Whoa, 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 let me add something. Once you create this, oh. you mm -hmm. have to go into here and change the preferences to point- To the file, oh. yes. Okay, all right. So in your next question, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so then now fast forward and when it's time to delete it and get back our space on our personal devices, do uh -huh. we reboot yeah. everything like in um, the first assignment to like get everything back in order or is it fine no. after that? No, it's fine after that. Okay. If you did everything to optimize your personal technology, uh, when you do this, it, it should you should not have to do anything else after that. If you, here's the catch. If you miss some steps in the 1.2 assignment, optimizing your personal technology, you'll know it. Because when you start running this appliance, everything will slow down. It'll, it'll be really painful. Um, and, and that's one way to tell whether or not your, your laptop or your PC uh, has been optimized effectively. Usually these things run pretty well inside the environment. Um, let me look now at my downloads folder. If I look at, let's go to, go to this now. Inside my temp folder, I now have an OVA file, right? So let's change the view of this. Instead of having just a zip file, I have one that says OVA. This is the one that I'm going to import as an appliance. So it's an it's an Oracle Virtual Box Appliance. That's what OVA stands for. And I'm going to go ahead and do that now, so you can see what it's like to complete Solution 1.4. So I'm now going to complete Solution 1.4. I'm going to oh, and let's see how big that is. So I just want to see how big it is compared to the ten gigabytes, if I look at this one after it's compressed, oh, it's not that different. I don't understand why they compressed it. Probably because it's easier to download if it's a zip file instead of an OVA file. A lot of antivirus programs freak out when you try to download something that has an OVA extension. They think a hacker is trying to get a hold of your stuff. I'm gonna go into Oracle and I'm gonna import an appliance and I'm gonna find the source of this thing in my local file system. And I'm gonna click on the folder so that I can navigate to that temp folder where I had set up things inside C, inside temp. There's my PG book OVA file. I'm gonna select that. So I'm going to import this, and it's going to build a virtual machine with this appliance file and put it inside the VM folder. So I click Next. Sometimes you get an error, and you have to change something that has to do with the network adapter, like right here. 
it says include only NAT. I recommend that you change this setting so it says generate a new MAC address for all network adapters. I've seen a lot of virtual appliances, virtual machines fail because what you wanted to do is you wanted to connect with a fresh uh, network address, not, not one that was cloned because it could be out there lurking somewhere else. So I'm going to say import. And it's building a virtual machine based on the appliance file that, that uses one computer processor, one CPU, two gigs of RAM. It has a DVD car, it has a DVD drive, a sound card, a network adapter. It uses Ubuntu Linux, right? For a, an operating system. It has all the stuff that's built in for the, the activities uh, that they use in the book. I have a solid state hard drive on my laptop and my laptop has 12 gigs of RAM. Uh, and I've done the personal optimization and it, it takes about three minutes to build. If, if your laptop has less RAM, if you don't have a solid state hard drive, but a traditional hard drive, um, if your disk is still defragmented a little bit, it may run slower. It may take 15 to 20 minutes to build this. In the book, it tells you what the password is to log in. So another reason for insisting that people have a legitimate copy of the textbook is because you don't even know how to start up the machine and log in uh, without the password that you get from the textbook. So yeah, that'll finish loading. When it unpacks, what we want to do is take a look and see how much disk space it'll take up. It should be about 20 gigs, 20 gigabytes of space on your hard disk. Any questions about our 1.4 solution? OK. In the time remaining, what I'd like to do is start covering some basics for the content from the chapters in our study guide. So one of our goals is to identify, label, and provide the basic uh, hardware components of the average computer. That's the second one, right? So you'll notice that um, the quote that I showed you from the textbook, I explain a little further in section A of the study guide, describe the essential scientific computing abilities expected of STEM professionals. But I actually, no, I actually quote the same thing. A research assistant must know how to organize, analyze data. This includes off the shelf, commercial off the shelf applications like Excel and Word and Access. That's an acronym, commercial off the shelves, COTS. A COTS application is, uh, 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 it's not, it's not something that you create by programming your own solution for scientific computing. You use the Access database or you use the Excel spreadsheet. You use uh, pre-built applications off the shelf uh, to perform scientific computing tasks for data collection, organization, and analysis. Any questions about what COTS means? Has anyone had a computer science course before uh, they've uh, enrolled in this course? Yes. OK. And who said yes? Luke. Oh, Luke, of course. <laughs> All right. So this is uh, a pioneer in computer science named John von Neumann came up with a model for computer hardware 
And this is his, this is a basic diagram of the model that he uh, defined for computing. It's, it's still referenced today. Basically what's important to understand is that computers are so revolutionary uh, because of some, I call them magical pieces, memory, computer memory or random access memory not only allows you to store data, but also the instructions that operate against the data. Now that may seem like a very trivial point, but the fact is your random access memory, the RAM in your system can store digital information, but it also stores what it's supposed to do, the tasks, the processing statements and all that, the calculations. The instructions that operate against the data are also stored in memory. This is like a workbench. Uh, if you had a workshop, memory represents a workbench. If you have a small workbench, you have to go to the shelves and bins where things are stored more often. If you think of a hard disk as the bins and shelves in a workshop, to use an analogy, you would be like the CPU you're the one that does the work you have your and, and your hands right you have hands and tools that you wield the random access memory is like the workbench that you use to to perform the tasks but if you have a very small workbench you can't do a whole lot before oh i got to get another tool oh i have to get more material so you have to go back out to the hard disk more often so a computer hard disk is both an input and an output device, as well as a keyboard and a mouse, a display and all that. But on this side, we, we consider the, the model for John Newman to be broken down into three zones. You have the memory, the active RAM, random access memory. You have the CPU, the central processing unit. And then you have the inputs and outputs, basically the persistent memory, the hard disk, which is like the bins and shelves on this to the side of the workshop, right? So you get a lot more activity going in and out of bins and, and shelves every time if you have a smaller workbench. If you have a very large workbench, you could put all of the tools and all the materials that you need to perform tasks in your workshop on that one workbench. And you never have to go to the bins or shelves, right? So having more RAM means you're not writing as much to a hard disk. If you have less RAM, it means you're gonna go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth to the hard disk, and you're gonna burn up your hard disk. That's what wears out hard disks. Less memory, more hard disk failure. You wear it out. Any questions about the John von Neumann model? I want you to be able to label the parts of this diagram from memory. The thing I want you to remember is that memory runs to and from the CPU. So this is a two-way uh, flow of data where input only flows in and output only flows out. If you're trying to remember how to label the parts of this diagram and you see the, the arrow going out, you're gonna remember, oh, that's an out arrow. Oh, that's an in arrow. So that's input and that's output. Oh, and when the, the CPU is running, it's taking and putting data on and off that random access memory chips. You know, it's basically running back and forth to the memory to do stuff. So that's one way to remember uh, what's going on here. Would it matter how we um, label the in between? Like the data, the instruction, if we put the instruction on top of the data, or you want it exactly like this? That's a very good question. Um, the short answer is no. Uh, the order doesn't matter. As long as you have instructions or data, and then the opposite down here, you're fine. And if you take an assessment and the order if you get it wrong and the order was reversed and that's the only thing that was wrong with it, then call it out and I'll post bonus for saying, hey, Kentop, you forgot to change this so that it didn't matter what the order was. It's a great question. 
I mean, in theory, it doesn't matter if instructions are out there first or data. Um, as long as those three uh, elements are there, ALU stands for arithmetic logic unit register. That's a very fast, very small version of RAM. So that's a memory register that the CPU uses right next to the where the calculations are performed. And the controller or control component is what helps the CPU manage all the tasks. So any other questions? Everybody know where the term bits came from? Binary digits, right? It's literally a contraction. BI and TS, bits. That's where that word comes from. If you have eight bits in a byte, you have eight bits in a row, that's called a byte, B-Y-T-E. So, yeah, there's more description here about the ALU and what it does. This is really important. Every CPU, every computer does a waltz, fetch, decode, execute. You need to understand that that's, that's the basic nature of how a CPU functions. It fetches information, it decodes the information, and then it executes whatever tasks. So I talk about the workshop module, you know, the analogy for workshop. And here's something to remember. Closest, fastest to the action. Any memory that gets closer to the CPU is more and more expensive. So the further you go away from the CPU in terms of memory, the more it can store at a lower cost, but the longer it takes to, to access, okay? So something on the hard disk takes a lot longer to access than something in memory. Um, I'm gonna put a link out here for, for these two um these two sessions so i noticed here it talks about part one and part two of coding essentials i have these uh previously recorded i'll put some links i'll change this into a link so you can click on it and watch those um at this point i'm going to stop but i want to check my import when it finishes importing, what you'll see is the virtual machine PG Book VM 2020. And it'll say it's powered off. To turn it on, you're going to want to avoid clicking the start option. But instead, you're going to want to hit this setting option. You're going to select network. And you're going to want to make sure that it says bridged adapter instead of NAT. If it says NAT, you're going to want to change it to bridged adapter. OK. Here it says there's an invalid setting detected. And this is easy to fix. It says the VMS VGA, the virtual machine, is configured to use a graphics controller other than the recommended one, VMS VGA. Please consider switching unless you have a reason to keep it. Where do you do that? You go to system. Nope, sorry. Uh, I would uncheck the floppy disk option because we don't have floppy disks. Under the display option, it, it wanted to use VBox VGA. It's saying that you should use VMS VGA. I would check the box that says enable 3D acceleration. And once again, make sure that when, when you select network, it says bridged instead of NAT for network address translation. Those changes again, select system, uncheck the box for floppy. Select display, hit the pull down, and select VMS VGA, and then check the box for enable. And then for network, make sure it says bridged adapter. Hit OK. 
then click start. It's actually better to do this, detachable start. Detachable start means that if your computer goes into like a power safe mode because, well, it's a laptop and you didn't have the power supply plugged in, then uh, it'll work. You'll get this weirdness to pop up on the screen. Then it'll say Oracle. Then it'll go back and forth like this. You'll see other gobbledygook. You'll see an error on screen. It'll look like, oh my gosh, this thing isn't working. What have I done? I have an error, just wait for it, wait for it. If you get to this screen right here, you're usually pretty good and it's usually gonna run just fine. So are we screen, is this the second screenshot? Well, this isn't the screenshot that you want. So um, to capture the screenshot, you don't wanna go full screen because if you press the print screen key here, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't work. What you want instead is to resize the window like this. Resize the window, click on your desktop, then hit print screen. What does that do for you? Um, it does this, it allows you to, now there's proof that you've loaded it up. If you get to this point and it's your desktop, you get full credit for the solution. And um, assuming this, the password it's asking for, it's coming from the book. Password is in the book. Okay. And I'll post extra credit if you log in using the password in the book. But I don't want to tell you the password because then people who didn't buy the book were, it's a long story, but believe it or not, not everybody buys the book. So <laughs> why am I doing that? Well, I explained to people that you're going to do a lot better in the course if you have the book. This is, this is one early demonstration in, in, you know, uh, in the very beginning of the semester that proves that point, right? So um anyway there you have it uh that's all you need to complete a solution the 1.4 solution are there any questions before we close for the day oh um one more thing i do want to review more of the material in um module one and I do want to give you a chance to see Coding Basics, Coding Essentials, the other two um, previously recorded video sessions. Therefore, uh, we're gonna push back on the first assessment deadline. Instead of having the first assessment due um, 31 August, we'll say the first assessment is due a week from today to September. So, so I will email you links for the other two um, recordings for programming basics. And then uh, if you cover the reading in the textbook, review the study guide and watch the two videos, uh, you'll be ready to take the assessment but I'll postpone the deadline for the assessment to two September instead of 31 August. So you, you need to have it done by the time we get to class uh, next week this time, okay? Any questions before we close? Uh, would you One more. Would I repeat that? And then there's another question, yes. Right now it says that your assessment, your first attempt at the assessment for module one is due Tuesday, 3 p.m. by the start of class. But I want you to have more time and I wanna review more in the study guide, uh, the rest of the stuff in the study guide with you. So what I'm gonna do is push this deadline back. So you have until two September, 
for your first attempt to the assessment module, then you'll have uh, through the end of the week, Saturday, 11.59 p.m. to do the reconciliation and the retake. Okay, D does that? Yeah, thank that you. you. needed me to repeat. Okay, good. Um, question, we had another question. Oh yes, um, so I just wanted to make sure of something. It's probably a ridiculous question, but last oh, night when we were optimizing our PCs, right? Yes. It had a section where we had to change, oh my gosh, I don't remember the numbers, but you, it was a seven number and then you times it by something and we had to change it and press okay, eight something. I don't know if it was- um, Did it have it to do- did it have to do with the um, gigabyte? Yeah, it had to preparing preparing our PCs to download the um, virtual machine setup or whatever it was. Uh -huh. I was just making sure that that eight number that you gave us, everyone, um, if we were supposed to do our own calculations, or that's the number where. That's we'll the, that's a great question. You were supposed to do your own calculation. Oh. All right. So. So, under advanced, when you finish doing the disk cleanup and then you do the defragmentation, you have a chance to increase the performance even further by setting up something called permanent swap file, or it's a Yes, virtual this memory. section here. Virtual mm -hmm. memory. This is the one you're talking about, right? Yes. Okay. So, so uh, I have I have a limit to the amount of disk space available on my system. Um, the general rule is, if you have, let's go to Task Manager. If I have Let's say I have four gigs of RAM, right? What you should do, if you have four gigs of RAM and you have plenty of hard disk space, is, is you should go to your calculator and multiply four times uh, three. And that equals 12 and then multiply that by 1024, and that's the number that you should use for that. And, and you know, for, for a laptop that has four gigs of RAM, that's the correct number you should set up. So if your laptop has four gigs of RAM and you put in 12288, that's, that's fine. What that's going to do is it's going to reserve. So in your C drive, uh, right now you'll see that I have 33 gigabytes of space uh, remaining. If I, if I change that setting, it's gonna take up 12 gigabytes, right? So it'll show uh, 33.2 minus 12. It'll take up some hard disk space, but it, what it's doing is it's reserving it's reserving dedicated disk space on your hard drive to use for virtual memory so that your RAM can work more efficiently. It gets back to this, it gets back to this picture. So you have a hard disk that has lots and lots of space for gigabytes and gigabytes. Most people have plenty of hard disk space. What they don't have is lots of RAM memory and this setting inside here allows me to tell Windows, okay, I want you to dedicate a certain amount of hard disk. And the key is it has to be clean, unfragmented hard disk space, empty hard disk space, which is, which is why you go through all the trouble to do disk cleanup and then disk defrag. When you do disk cleanup and disk defrag, what happens, and let me show this to you. This is really kind of cool. 
So if I go into where it says my PC or this PC and I use my right mouse button and then I click on it and use manage, it pulls up this computer management option and I'm gonna select disk management, right? So um, when you defrag your, when you do disk cleanup and disk defragmentation, uh, what it does is it takes all of the data that's scattered all over the disk and it shoves it toward the front of the, the front, the very front of the hard disk. And it leaves all this open empty space toward the end. Um, did, er did everybody get a chance to see disk defrag yet? I think it was in the video. Yeah, in the video. Did I show you the expanded view? I mean, well, I we had to, yeah. So if I did everything. I just, I did that part wrong. So I was wondering if maybe you could tell me how to go back and fix it or maybe after class I could share my screen and you help me out real quick. Oh yeah, yeah, I can do that. We can do that right now. And, and uh, in fact, we should. Um, but, but basically when you finish this process, after you do the disk cleanup and then you do the optimize, this, this little colored picture here, it's showing all these multicolored data sections. What's happening is that all this, all this multicolored stuff, you have data chunks all over your hard disk. And when you do the cleanup and the defrag, it organizes it all. It puts all the fragments together so that when you read back a data file, it's all one chunk. It all reads together instead of having, instead of your computer having to go all over the place to find it. So fragmentation is a natural wear and tear kind of thing with the hard drive. Then when you set up your permanent swap file here, it, it reserves this open clean space so that basically when your RAM is full, when your RAM is full, like right now I'm using six gigs of RAM. If I start opening up other apps, it's gonna need to park what's stored in RAM temporarily and it needs six gigs of space to park all of that when I open up three browsers, 10 tabs in my browser, my email, all those different things. It's going to park what's in memory, all six gigs that's loaded out on the hard disk. That's what virtual memory is. If I don't, if I use the defaults for Windows, it automatically determines how, how much and where, and it's all, it's all hamburger. It's all just little chunks of stuff all over the map. You get this very different performance result if you set up permanent uh, memory. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the sharing and recording, but then you can share your screen and we'll take a look. And I'm guessing you probably don't, it's probably not as, um, I'm, I'm guessing you're okay. Unless you're very short on disk space, you're probably okay. Um, yeah, I don't think it really affected anything because like I said at the beginning of class, I did recently change my hard drive and everything. Right. But I still want it to be, you know, correct. So sure, sure you do. Um, if if anybody wants to stick around and see what we're doing so you can check your own settings in a like fashion, uh, please feel free to uh, hang tough. This should only take a couple minutes yet. Um, did anyone else have any questions about the material or the assignments we've covered at this point? 